Will you pray with me, please? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. We were cleaning out our basement this weekend, and I came across a box of childhood keepsakes that, among other 80 and 90s treasures, included a well-worn WWJD bracelet. Now, the WWJD phenomenon actually began by a Kansas congregational minister named Charles Sheldon, who published a book in 1896 called In His Steps, What Would Jesus Do? And the book was so much of a hit that even 90 years later, a woman named Janine Tinklenberg at a church in Holland, Michigan, was so impacted by this book and this question that she posed it to her youth group at the time. And because friendship bracelets were very popular, she decided to create a bracelet and even t-shirts for the kids in her youth group with the letters WWJD to help them remember this question, what would Jesus do? Now, the WWJD phase of, of American Christianity was probably at its peak when I was in high school. And the idea was that the sight of these letters on your wrist would cause you to think twice before doing something mean or something sinful, to think about what you were saying and how you were acting, because that is definitely not what Jesus would want you to do if it was something that caused harm. The concept, of course, was a good one. How we live as followers of Christ should absolutely impact how we live. There's no question. But like all good fads, the meaning behind it got a little muddy as it became more popular. And so the public image of simply wearing a WWJD bracelet sometimes became more important than actually what you were doing while you were wearing it. And at least in my circles, choices like what kind of Christian t-shirt you wore or choosing to listen only to Christian music became proof of your devotion much more than the way that you spent your money or how you interacted with others or served and cared for people. WWJD often seemed to dissuade people from particular kinds of behavior more than actually encouraged people to live like Jesus. And so what was supposed to be this personal faith practice to grow as a disciple instead became this public symbol of what you wanted other people to know about how good of a disciple you were. Now this week in our journey through the Wesleyan way of discipleship, we are taking a look at acts of devotion, which on that image of the Jerusalem cross can be found at the intersection of piety and personal now, acts of piety are ways that we love God. And personal is obviously ways of behaving that we choose to do personally as individuals. And so while worship is at the intersection of piety and public, how we love God in a corporate way, devotion is about our individual acts of piety, how we practice loving God when no one is watching. Now, for John Wesley, acts of devotion included things like reading scripture, fasting, or praying. He considered these ways of nurturing not only his love of God, but knowledge of God. And so for Wesley, who was known for his personal devotional practice of rising at 4 a.m. for several hours of prayer each morning, these kinds of acts of devotion were absolutely the groundwork and the basis for a strong faith. Searching the scriptures, practicing self-denial, praying, those are ways of staying close to God. After all, how could anyone profess to be a Christian, much less live as a disciple of Christ, without a close relationship with Christ? In other words, you can wear the WWJD bracelet, but how can you actually know the answer to what Jesus will do if you don't know Jesus? Now, this is apparently not new territory, because in our scripture reading for today, Jesus's original disciples were grappling with that very same question. 
Now, these were people who literally walked in the footsteps of Jesus, watching him, learning from him, serving alongside of him, getting to know Jesus personally in his life and ministry. And this conversation about his identity takes place at about the midway point of Mark's gospel. So these disciples have had many chances to see Jesus in action and to understand who he is. And it would seem obvious after all of this that, of course, they know who Jesus is. But something prompts Jesus to ask the question, who do people say that I am? And even the more important follow-up, who do you say that I am? Now, it's no surprise that the disciples indicate that other people thought Jesus might be John the Baptist or Elijah or a prophet because people were trying to understand who Jesus was within the framework of the Jewish tradition. So even if Jesus was the fulfillment of their messianic hopes, it was logical to understand him in relationship with these other religious figures. But I think that part of what Jesus is getting at by also asking his disciples, okay, that's fine, but who do you say that I am? Is that these up-close and personal disciples, they might not actually fully understand who Jesus is any better than anyone else. And in fact, while Peter says all the right things, calling him the Messiah, it is clear that when Jesus begins to describe what that actually looks like, Peter is not having it. And so he argues about it. He rebukes Jesus, actually. And then Jesus does the same thing back to Peter. And I think that Peter and Jesus' rebuke off is one of the most interesting exchanges in all of the Gospels. Peter self-righteously telling Jesus how wrong he is about what it means to be a suffering Messiah. And then Jesus taking Peter to task for basically telling him how to do his job. There's a lot of layers of relationship and of meaning going on there. Yes, Peter believes that Jesus is the Messiah. But he seems to have no idea what that really means. Not a life of power and security where people acclaim Jesus as Lord and he takes his place at the head of power, but a life of sacrifice and rejection, of suffering, and ultimately even death and resurrection. Now, these are very different understandings of who Jesus is. And if Peter considered himself one of Jesus' disciples, he was probably realizing that he probably wasn't sure what he had signed on for. The cross was a symbol of shame and punishment in the Roman Empire, not the mark of a savior. So what was Jesus thinking, telling his disciples to deny themselves and take up their own crosses in order to follow him? How was that a strategy for success? How could it possibly convince anyone to actually follow him and want to become his disciple? Now, I think there are probably plenty of people still today who hear that passage and think, why would I want to follow Jesus? There's enough suffering and sacrifice already. Why would I willingly choose a path that would invite more of it? But I want to be clear that I don't think Jesus is calling us to a life of misery and martyrdom here. That is not the message of the gospel. The gospel is a message of love and of freedom and forgiveness and, yes, of sacrifice. But it is an invitation to life, full, abundant, eternal life. And so Jesus invites us to discover this real life by devoting ourselves to following Jesus in our thoughts, words, and deeds. And in doing so, to commit ourselves to sacrifice beyond what is easy, to serve beyond what is comfortable, to love beyond what seems possible, to live with justice and mercy and faithfulness, whether it is popular or not. Because a relationship with Jesus is what makes that possible. Jesus invites us to what Bishop Easterling calls a cruciform life, a life shaped by the cross. The cross is a symbol of suffering and sacrifice, yes. But in Jesus Christ, it is also the very embodiment 
of the power of love and redemption and new life. So if we are to honestly practice devotion, to practice loving God personally when no one is looking, to have a faith that is measured not by external appearance or by public profession, but by the state of our hearts, then like Peter, we need to also understand and know and recognize what we are really signing on for, who we are really signing on with. And we do need to be willing to deny ourselves, lay down our earthly understanding of life in order to receive the fullness of life that Jesus invites us to. That's why the question of who Jesus is really matters so much. Professor Caroline Lewis of Luther Seminary writes about this passage, who do you say that I am is at the same time, who will you say that you are? That's the rub of this question, the heart of its difficulty. I think she's right. Who Jesus is makes all the difference if we call ourselves disciples of Jesus because it tells us everything about who we are and who we are willing to be. But this interior stuff can be really tricky. We might be tempted to believe that if we just focus on the external acts of service or worship or caring for others or loving or doing things that are public, that that's enough. That'll cover it. And there is something to be said for showing up and practicing acts of faith, even if you aren't always feeling it. Faith is more than just about feeling. That's true. But when it boils down to it, you simply can't be a disciple of someone that you don't know. And if we focus only on external acts and not on nurturing our own faith, then those acts of worship or of service or of love or of caring, no matter how heartfelt, will ultimately deplete us because we will be sharing water from a well that will go dry if we are the one trying to fill it rather than drawing from the living water of Christ. We need that relationship with God to fill us up, to sustain us, so that we can go and live it publicly in the world and be equipped for that life of sacrifice and surrender that Jesus calls us to. So we need to practice loving God so that we can love those who God loves. We need to practice confessing and receiving forgiveness from God and with God so that we can extend that to others. We need to practice learning more about who God is so that our lives can actually reflect that God to the world. So how do we do that? Well, starting with John Wesley's suggestions, searching the scriptures, fasting, prayer, that's not a bad place to start. These can seem intimidating if you don't already have a regular devotional practice. So it's important to remember, though, that even people who read scripture regularly or fast and pray, they are not becoming experts in something. This is not a matter of expertise. This is about relationship. And people who practice acts of devotion are learning to love God. They are deepening their relationship in history and tradition in living word and physical actions, in listening and being present and showing up. The journey of discipleship is not about catching up to someone else's relationship. It's making sure that you have your own. And all of these acts of devotion can be done in different ways. You can study scripture by working your way through a particular book of the Bible, or you can simply pick up your Bible and see what you open it to. You can stick with a particular passage for several days at a time, repeating it, questioning it, wrestling with it, praying with it. Or you can move through something different each day. Likewise, fasting and self-denial can take place in all kinds of ways, whether from a particular type of food or a particular meal or over a certain time period, like giving up lunch or fasting on Fridays. You can also fast from social media, which honestly in this day and time might feel like a bigger sacrifice than skipping lunch. 
And as for prayers, there's just quite simply hundreds of ways to pray. With words, with silence, with walking, dancing, sitting, meditating, listening, you name it. The biggest obstacle to prayer is just being willing to try it. And these are just the basics for how to practice devotion. You probably have your own ways of spending intentional time with God. Lighting a candle, spending time outside, creating artwork or poetry. All of these acts of devotion are just personal ways of expressing your love to God, of getting to know God. And the point is simply to practice it, to willingly commit yourself to wanting to know God. If you're in a Lenten small group, then you'll talk this week about how you decide together to practice acts of devotion. But if you're not in a Lenten group, or if you just want to talk more about how to get started, or how to step up your own practice, then please reach out to me, reach out to Reverend Scott, so that we can talk and walk with you. Before I close, though, I do want to acknowledge that as much as we use the phrase, having a relationship with God, as though it is a relationship with a friend or a spouse or a coworker. Being in a relationship with God is not the same thing as a relationship with another human being. Faith can sometimes feel one-sided, like you're praying to the air or listening to this invisible voice and maybe even wondering deep down if there really is someone on the other end. I just want to acknowledge that I've certainly felt that way. And I believe that there is. I believe that God is there, that God is present. But it's okay to admit that we struggle with that feeling. We struggle sometimes to understand exactly who God is or what Jesus really would do. It might even seem on occasion that we talk more about God than we do to God. But I've always loved the classical proverb, bidden or unbidden, God is present. Because it suggests that it is not our devotion that draws us, that draws God to us. It is our devotion that helps to illuminate God's real present here among us and draw us to God. And these practices are meant to help tune our senses to knowing and recognizing our God, who is perhaps closer than we might think. The skateboarder Tony Hawk, who is arguably the most well-known professional skateboarder in history, also has a notorious track record for not being recognized in real life. He has regularly written about these encounters that usually just include some version of, has anyone ever told you that you look like Tony Hawk? One, he describes a TSA agent was looking at his ID saying, Hawk, like that skateboarder, Tony Hawk? Yes, exactly. Hmm, I wonder what he's up to these days. Or another, a person at a gas station. Has anyone ever told you that you look a lot like a young Tony Hawk? Or while shopping with his daughter, waiting for her outside a department store or dressing room, he was engaged with one of the employees there who said, has anyone ever told you that you look like that guy, Tony Hawk? Yeah, I've gotten that sometimes. That's cool. He's cool. These people who over and over again are standing right in the presence of someone that they think they know and yet don't recognize. Even when you're right in front of someone, it turns out you might not always know who they are. Now, I don't think that Tony Hawk would ever compare himself to Jesus, but I suspect that that is a little bit of how Jesus' disciples felt as well. It may be all of these thousands of years later that we are still trying to grapple with that, of how we recognize the presence of Christ right in front of us, to really know who Jesus is and how we are called to live. It is clear that knowing someone is more than just being able to describe them or know something about them. Knowing and knowing God takes time and patience 
commitment to deepening a relationship. And it's how we learn what it really means to be a disciple of Christ, to give ourselves to that commitment, to devote ourselves to looking and to watching and to listening. So perhaps if we are to think of the practice of devotion as the practice of discovering God's presence, we might even realize when we look for it that God has been here all along showing us the way. Amen.